You are listening to the Sacred Geometry Portal podcast, where each Monday musing plus one in-depth interview per moon takes you through the portal to the patterns of nature, the architecture of the cosmos, and the divine language of our minds. Your host, Elizabeth Diane, expands your perception of the world and the awe of creation. With a light heart, she encourages an exploration to find the truth as it is evident to you. Every episode opens doors to self-empowerment, demystifies the power of symbology and archetype, intersects relationships with matter and spirit, then circles back to ground in these seeds of life into the kind of wisdom you can apply to your being, soul, and purpose. Welcome to the Sacred Geometry Portal Podcast. wrote this music called spirit visions since doing that and um it 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 was like i feel like when i'm writing that it's it's magic music coming down and a lot of people are just saying they really like the melodies that i'm coming up with and the chord progressions and things and it's not it's not angular music i i think we have enough of that going in negative stuff in the world i need to bring balance it with more and more positive sounding music more with a melody with something will make you feel joyous something will up uplifting right. and um even if it might be a sad piece of music i still want to bring moments where we're going oh well you know there's hope and joy coming and um um yeah so that's that's me as a composer Welcome, Sacred Spears, to another episode of Sacred Geometry Portal Podcast. And today I have a a really wonderful, inspiring guest, Margaret Brandman. And Margaret is a multi-award winning composer who's received wide acclaim for her powerful compositions characterized by an original approach to tonality, melodic richness, and engaging expression. Her musical output ranges from orchestral works to solo compositions composed across a wide variety of genres from contemporary classical through to jazz and Latin American. Her article, The Power of Music, was published in the 1998 annual edition of the Australian publication Wellbeing magazine shortly after Margaret became a second level Reiki channel. As a respected and awarded pedagogue and author of an extensive extensive range of innovative music educational materials, her interest in music education and composition has sparked a fascination with musical and geometric patterns, frequency and harmonics, and spiritual connections, which is why I'm super excited to welcome you today, Margaret. Thank you for being here. Yeah, my pleasure. It's been lovely to um, be be speaking with you today. Yes, especially um, with our common interests. I've been really excited about talking with you because I'm passionate about piano and music plays such a big role in my life and the lives of, of, I really think, everyone. Um, It's fundamental. Yes, it's um, how all our cells vibrate in in relationship to um, music and on so many levels 
mm-hmm. from healing to emotional states to yeah to joy bringing joy so yeah I love that that somebody so accomplished with so many accolades and awards understands that this all comes back around to what can bring us joy and you really seeing the purpose and integrating this with with the human experience and how everything's connected so yeah i'd like to hear more um well i just background uh, i've read a lot of uh, carl jung's uh, books and uh thinking um, about synchronicities in life and um after i did the reiki course back in 1994 so many synchronicities just just flowed and uh so so many joyous little meetings and chance things that have happened and uh, through music and through um just just meeting chance meeting on the street or or in a train and um yeah the, the joyousness of of that and and i think when you have that it shows you're on the right path if if you get this chance meeting it's like the i call them people my travel angels if i'm traveling and somebody comes and suddenly you meet and there's this moment of connection it might be only 10 minutes but um mm-hmm. it's like wow you know it's, it's it brings brings you to a realization of where where you're at and what you're doing so i've got so many of those wonderful things yeah um, shall i tell you the one that you read about the the article from the power of music well there was a backstory to that because i was in a train in germany and i met a lady who was actually an ex doctor um she said she'd gone and done yoga and then she said, I can't be in the German medical system anymore. And she'd gone into grief counselling. So then she put, she pulled out um, uh, some tarot cards that she had. And she said, if you've never done tarot before, just choose three. And the one that I chose had a colourful picture of the world on it and the ankh. Um, mm. And so I... Um, I, I I was sort of excited about doing that, and then my next stop was to be in um, England, and a, a lady had contacted me about writing a UNICEF book on music, mm-hmm. and I was telling her about my experience on the train with this lady, and and I looked up, and there was an unk this big up on her mantelpiece, and I went whoa. <laughs> <laughs> And then two days later, I was doing a, a lecture on, on composition at uh, Goldsmiths University in London. And the young lady who was uh, my assistant was wearing one, just as you're wearing one around your neck. She was wearing an unk. So I'd seen the symbol three times. I'd done Reiki in 1994, Reiki one. So I came back and I said to the uh, Reiki master, who happened to be the editor of Wellbeing magazine, she yeah. said, what, 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 what brings you to do level two? What happened? And I told her the experience. Then she said, well, would you write an article on music for, for us? And so I did. And that's that power of music where I, I've sent you the, uh, the clip. And on right. the front of this magazine, it's got the colourful picture of the world and it had a CD stuck to it. <laughs> and it's personal and planetary healing. So it was, this was like back my, my tarot card basically oh um the one yeah that was like my tarot card um was on the front of front of this and then there's another story with the, that comparison one that you're showing mm-hmm. um so so I came back and I wrote that that now at the same time I was writing my pictorial patterns for keyboard scales and chords um which I'll send you you can put that one up and oh. um I was um, the math and music book that you saw together with that. Um, mm-hmm. I was I was thrilled to to find this book, and I was uh, I, I got organized to get about twenty copies for teachers I was coaching, and um, the ladies the author author is Trudy Hamill Garland, and she lives in San Francisco. Mm-hmm. So. The, uh, the person here in Australia that was distributing the book said, oh, I think, you you know, I, I'll connect you. So he gave me her address. I wrote to her. And I, in the letter, I said, look, if you ever come to Australia, I'd love to show you the Opera House on the Blue Mountains. 
And she writes back, it just so happens that I'm coming to Australia in three months from now. And synchronicity. So she arrived in Australia and she gave me a signed copy of the book. Here, here it is. I can so that you can see it. All her. Oh yeah. And um, and then uh, you know, then we compared, and then I said, "Hey, look at the picture on your book, and look at the look at what they've chosen for me." <laughs> <laughs> Talk about math and music connections, and um, yeah, so that was a really amazing synchronicity yes. and she just said I get so much mail I hardly open any any of it I just happen to open your your particular letter so she came here and I took her to the Blue Mountains and we did what we said we were going to do and uh, uh, and she's written and her other book is on Fibonacci series so this is oh. where I got um, introduced to it she's got a section here um, pages 110 I'll give her a, a bit of a, a plug on that book where she she goes into those Fibonacci numbers and the piano and so um, yes uh, and I'd love to hear more about that as well and we you know um, we were talking about synchronicity and you mentioned the pendants or the onk that synchronicity and then you said like the one you're wearing and so th this one that I'm wearing is actually a crop circle that yes. became my logo that I used for Sacred Geometry Portal. And I happen to be in Mount Shasta, um, just started teaching again in Mount, after I'd moved from Washington to Mount Shasta. And there was a little festival with people's crafts and, and there's this one man that had all these different pendants and organite. And, and when I saw this one, it just, it stopped me right away. You know, that's my logo. And in fact, those are the colors I use for my my brand, and so I, you know, I took that as a, a sign that you know I'm on my path. I started teaching again here, and so I love how synchronicity happens, and and I think at the core of everything in the universe, we have vibration, and with that vibration is forming like codes of information, and so whether like uh, I love the work, work of Carl Jung and I haven't even read the red book yet but I hear that's just the deepest of information but just how things can become coherent and line up and synchronicities can come through to us I think are um, so interconnected with sacred geometry as frozen music like yeah. if you look at a cymatic pattern mm -hmm. um, and it's all information and and just wave patterns coming to us that we perceive. The string theory as well. The the, the string yeah. theory that things are just moving along these amazing strings, and you can have a thought, and the, somebody ten thousand miles away can have that same thought at the same moment, and uh, and particularly you know when you meet, meet with a clairvoyant, um, yes. which I, I've had. This amazing experience with the clairvoyant who was the organist at Sydney Town Hall at the time and I did an arrangement for him and when I came to bring him the arrangement he said um, let me hold something an object to watch and he did a reading for me and uh, downloaded so much information from the universe um, one of which is that I've got, I would be writing lots of songs and I had written many before that but since then I've written um, six ones called Songs of Love and Desire. But also I've written the 12 songs in the Cosmic Wheel of the Zodiac song cycle so that's the co cover of my album and um the the this whole song cycle came about because my my dear friend Benita Rayner uh had the idea look I wanted to write uh, one song for every sign of the zodiac and she's an amazing poet she calls herself an astro poet and oh, she man. has distilled the essence of every star sign in this you know, like a, a a set of lyrics or uh, poetry 
And I was so inspired by her lyrics that the music just flowed and uh, became, you know, manifested very quickly. And we've had it uh, recorded by the Prague uh, Mixed Choir and uh, they, they did a concert of that. And, of course, you can see all the, the symbols for the astrology around, around that. And I, I actually loved that starburst image, which... Um, I, it, you know, I, I researched the image and then we put the, the, the symbols around it. So uh, as a musician too, I always liked the number 12 because we have 12 keys and we do a lot with 12. Yes. It's five, sevens and 12s are very important, the musical connections. But um, yeah. Yeah. she's she, like one, one of her songs, uh, which is about Lion, it's called Lion Love, it's a Leo song. And the final line is for true harmony. And mm -hmm. other line finishes um, and uh, about, you know, coming back to the heart and things like that. So she's just written some most amazing lyrics and, uh, um, yeah, people could explore that. Absolutely. That it's, yeah. The album's available all sorts of places and different versions have been done but I've also done some instrumental versions of some of the songs for cello and for violin and uh, they work melodically very well. I'll be um, actually uh, in Amsterdam in, in uh, September I'm doing two concerts of my music um, and we'll be singing some of these songs uh, for, for the concerts in Amsterdam. So, oh. um, but uh, yeah, I, I just I when I was working with the designers at the company, which is Palma Recordings, you know, they said, "What would you like on on this?" And I found the image, and basically, I said, "This is what I I'd like." And I the circular things meant like mandalas. A, a lot of my albums, I I like to get like a mandala style Im image on, um, and. Um, I, th I think I had, man from reading Jung, I had mandalas all over the place when I was young, <laughs> um, you know, and when I was raising my children, they, they, you know, they had mandalas on the walls and things like that, which yeah. goes like with crop circles as well, doesn't it? So the images. Absolutely. And, and so, um, so, so many things that bring us back to center and that remind us of the core of what we are. And that's what I love about this image that you have on your cover. I'm going to be, for people listening on the podcast, I'm going to be putting links to all of this in the description so people can see what we're talking about. Of course, I'll upload it to YouTube as well, but then they can also um, easily find where they can hear your music. Yes. Yeah. Uh, that'll, be, that'll be good. But yeah. So that, that particular one, you know, um, when she came to me, that the 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 lyrics resonated so much with me, and I thought this is something that we really have to manifest, both of us as as a as a team, and um, bring bring her in her insights into astrology, mm -hmm. into a form a musical form, so a lot of people can enjoy it. Mm -hmm. And even if you're not into astrology, the lyrics are so much about the human condition and how we are. You that can is so get beautiful on that level as well. Right. I I first was introduced to astrology as evolutionary astrology. And what I loved about it is that it acknowledged that we each have our own unique design, our own kind of soul signature, and that our chart is simply like a thumbprint of our soul. And mm -hmm. that it's not that, oh, now the planets are shifting and it's forcing you to become this way or that way. It looks at how much have you evolved in your life and also placement of, of the planets, which are just energies of information that, that then set us up for our life the way it's divinely created. And mm -hmm. so I, I find that there's ways to approach astrology, no matter what a person's viewpoint is, that just connects us to this world that we're in you know yes. yeah and, and I, we, i'm just going to say aren't we all really stardust everybody on the planet is stardust exactly <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right all the little molecules are formed from what came from the the stars and we flew yeah. in um, another line that she's got is it's like um um even the water we breathe even the and even the water we drink and even the air that we breathe 
through um, many, um, I should actually get it in front of me, um, and through many cells have been in myriad ages past. She's talking about the fact that all, you know, every cell on the body, every everything on the planet has been through everything else. And it's in her lyrics, you know. So this was really profound lyrics and it comes across as in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. What a and we've got, we've got a, a, a printed book with all the music so people can actually play and sing from the music and at the back we've got all the lyrics as, as separate things as well. Awesome. So, so people might mm. like to come onto that. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I would I would love to hear more then about how you visualize music and um you know any stories that, that led you to the system that you have. Um, this is really important stuff. <laughs> and I'll come back to the music healing things and remind me to talk about my friend Sarah Hopkins, who um, has what, well, I may, maybe I'll talk about that now and then. I'll yeah, go. yeah. So Sarah is um, a composer, Australian composer, and she has um, she her music website is called Music for the Soul. Music for the Soul. And her, she's had bits of her music used in um, a movie called Boy Choir with Dustin Hoffman, you know, um, producing that. Um, but she can get the most amazing sounds out of the cello that sound like birds and ocean. And um, there's a new movie out called Blueback, an Australian composer, Nigel Westlake, wrote the music, but he used some of her music in there too. But she has developed these instruments called whirlies, which are large pieces of tubing that you swing around your head. And they go up the harmonic series, oh, each one, five, eight, in three, five, and oh. um, they're all tuned to natural tuning, and each one of them will heal uh, or affect a different part of a different chakra. So from the root chakra through. And, and I've uh, been wondering where to get those. <laughs> now uh, I know. Yes, we, she sells them from her website. So good. good. Uh, and actually, I have one. I have some in my my cupboard because. Um, um, I, I great. I use it as a teaching tool to demonstrate harmonics and you know why you don't double the major third in a chord and all those sorts of things. And, and people say, "Why do I do have to do that?" And I said, "Well, have a listen." And and it's really great because I get the kids to come and swing them, and there's a bit of exercise, and they go, up, you know, you have to move. And uh, yeah, they're amazing instruments and go together with this music healing. Let me just backtrack. I, we'll come back to my system. Um, back in 1980, I was invited to represent Australia at the first uh, Congress in Women in Music in New York. Okay. And at the time, there were lots of amazing women composers and um, it was just, I, I had performed some of my music there, but I went to a session by another lady who was a flute, uh, flautist, flutist, and um, she just her thing was to get everybody to just lie on the floor, relax, close eyes, and she played the pure flute tones. And each time uh, about two-thirds of the people all visualised the same colour. So I've been very interested in how the music, the music colour relationship goes. Oh, that's then, synesthesia in a way. It is, it is. But I probably have a bit of that when I'm composing as to what colour I want the, the music to be. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> one is called Healing with Sound, and it's by yes. Olivia Dewhurst Maddock. And at the back of it, she has exactly that, the, the, the information on stuff that we're talking about, the crystals, and there was a there was a sh uh, page there where each of the colours um, and and the notes every note that you played and it had a colour uh, rainbow colours from C through B. Um, I had I had the picture. I'll send it to you after you can put yeah, it. Yeah, please do. It's going to be um, this this is gonna this podcast is going to come with a wealth of resources for people. <laughs> yes. Um, 
uh, I couldn't find I found it yesterday but anyway it, the the knowledge that was shared at the time when I was there was that there is a the rainbow colors three C through B you know C D E F G A B uh -huh. and red is C and you're going through B is the purple um and it's your high spiritual color oh really see in Mount so, Shasta everybody's all about the purple and the high spiritual so there you go know that so, yeah and then the relationship also I think she was discussing was that um Bach wrote his B minor mass the most spiritual work in B minor and then F is green and so Beethoven chose the key of F for his pastoral symphony all about the great outdoors yeah so people choose colors I was writing a lot of music in D for a long time, and orange was a color I was relating to. It was beautiful. Yeah. And so I have as some of the back to my piano method, some of the, the tunes you I've got one called Green Tree. Well, it's in F. So I've I've used it. <laughs> I've used that when I was writing the piano method to, to uh, and, uh, introduced it here and there. When I wrote, wrote a piece in a particular key, I gave it a color name. You know, yes. So, so the the synesthesia, the the connection between music and color. A lot of people can see it. Some people can't. But um, right, if people don't of, know what synesthesia is, it simply means that ability to see color with music so when they hear music they're also seeing color and it may be moving and 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 it can also be um i've read it in, it, somebody can um think that a color looks like a chicken and, and they, you know, right. they, and the cross messaging of different things you know so um, yes they and perceive color and sound in in different ways like not not even just color and sound but other things as well so um and and this is all um sort of documented by patanjali in the yoga sutras of patanjali there's all these mudras and chants that allow different kind of circuitry to connect within us so that we do have these kind of these cities or superpowers in a way mm. so that's just fascinating that and and to be able to understand and then compose music based on this this natural sort of synergy of color and um an intention um yeah it's really amazing <laughs> yeah i find as a composer they you know if i have lyrics and they they touch on particular topics the key I need to write it comes immediately. Like if it's things to do with a you know dark um, topic or something yeah. a bit spooky, you know F minor comes to mind, or you know, and if it's a bright you know sunny day thing, you know back to D major, you know, so the, those sorts of things. Um, so you've got the key, the key and the color and the mood and all connecting. And it makes your composition nice and rich, I think, you know. Ah, so. uh, yeah, I agree. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, you know, I'm thinking about a little story now. Um, I, I started to share with you before just about my own experience with music and being four years old and hearing music coming through me from I don't know where, and I just had to play it. And... So I went over and sat down at my grandma's piano and just started playing. I knew, of course, because I could hear, I was not playing the notes that I was hearing, but the expression that was pouring through me, just I just had to start. And since then, I've loved piano. I took piano lessons. I had a, uh, speak about synchronicities, I had a piano gifted to me when I was seven um, at this time where I just felt again like this compulsion like i have to play piano and one manifested within a week and lessons from the church organist you know for my parents who you know didn't have the funds but the organist said i'll teach her and i started learning yeah, it was beautiful and i started learning the uh, the kind of traditional method that uh, that the teachers in the u.s were taught with 
reading notes and memorizing a lot of memorizing things, you know, the, the C, C, D, E, F, G, you know, the notes and the scales. Yeah. And I really had a hard time because I could hear, and that's how it started. I could hear the music I wanted to play and really wanted help how to get that out through my hands into the, to the music. And yet I understood that it's really important to, you know, if you learn to read notes, you understand so much. And I took a lot of music theory, which I loved. And then finally I had a, a music theory teacher who um, would have us get up on the blackboard and she would play notes and she would have our, our back to the keyboard and we would have, you know, the, the five, the staff, the, the treble yeah. and bass staff lines, and we could write the notes we were hearing. And they had this, I remember this aha moment when she would play a chord and we would write the notes on there. Instantly, I could tell the, um, the chord in terms of like, was it a third or a fourth or a fifth or a seventh or whatever, you know, this for yeah. people who are musical. It's yes, the spacing. I, it's, yeah, the, what space. was it? The, the interval between the not so much yeah. of the chord, yes, but that's where, where I'll, I'll talk a little bit about my. Yeah, music. that's what I, because this yeah. was like this first moment of me seeing that that music was proportion and ratio. And what I love about sacred geometry is proportion and ratio. It's relationship, that's everything in relationship, right? And then what do they feel like? How do they affect the body? What do they do, you know? to yeah. us on an emotional level on a physical level and that's what i loved when i saw what you, you know what you were doing is that you have a system to me that seems really natural with music yes. yeah so do you want to so share? instead of struggling with all the note names mm -hmm. um it's more looking at the space between them that's exactly what you're talking about the intervals so i start start off with intervals uh, I introduce people to where the C's are on the piano so that they've got a location spot. But from there, mm -hmm. you're basically following the flow and, and the language I use is stepping and skipping. So step up one up and then skip over one. And yeah. then instead of using all the number, I now the next one I call skip plus one, which is that's the space between those. And uh -huh. then the larger one is a double skip as a jump. So I'm using that language, that easy language. So you can actually play and insert the timing and the direction and you uh -huh. can sing it this way and you can start anywhere on the piano. <clears throat> Let's see if I get my voice going. So you might do one, two, three, four, step up, two, three, four, step up, two, skip down, two, step, step, skip. So you can use that language. Oh. And you can then do it both hands, it makes no difference which hand you do it in, mm -hmm. and you can think the same language in both hands, and you don't have that whole layer of note naming to remember, which yes. slows you down. Slows me down. Yep. And as you were trying to go, I hear this in my head, how do I get it out? Well, what you're hearing is the intervals. You're not hearing a G or a D. You're hearing the space. So you want to be able to translate that space that you're hearing to the space on the piano or whatever mm -hmm. it's you're into. Mm -hmm. And um, I came across this system when I was introduced to C cleft reading when I was at university. And before that, I thought, oh, I'm a pretty good reader, treble and bass cleft. And then um c clef means that you it's the viola clef you know that the violas and the um tenor clef is used by the cello so yeah. they just place c on a different staff line and that's mm -hmm. just really your anchor point and right. then i was playing and the tutor that i had said look if you don't know the name of the note you have to read the interval well that was my aha moment uh -huh. because i was teaching my my students they were struggling with the note names. And I said, well, you know, you just started out. You don't know your note names. Let's do the interval. And I just developed the system from there. And they went, oh, gee, just, you know, <laughs> so much easier to do it this way. And okay, I'd like to show this too while you're talking. But this is where I thought the sacred geometry comes in because I had an idea to show all the 12 major scales in one view, which is I call the grand view there. And you can see how all the patterns relate to each other. 
um, in in one go instead of taking 10 years to learn it um, you can make connections between one scale and the other mm -hmm. and um, find the fingering easily I've, I've explored that in this book which is the pictorial patterns I'll send you the cover for that at that okay point. great um, and uh, then if you show the second one of these ones so there's another one where I show now this is what I found was interesting now you're pianist so can you see how the a major scale that i've got there at the top has black notes in the third sixth and seventh positions yes yeah. so the names of those sharps are c sharp f sharp g sharp well when you go underneath to the a flat scale the white notes are in the same position and the names are c f and g right and i don't think anybody's actually really shown it like that in juxtaposition it is it is so complementary the a and the a flat and they're like they're like mirroring each other photographic photographic kind of photographic negatives of each other you know like exactly it, yeah and, and in architecture that, everything's figure ground like there's not just walls there's the space between the walls and so that would be you know, like the contrast of light and dark, how they play together, how they interlock, yeah. and make sense of the whole that way. That's it. I mean, I'm I'm a good stop person. I love to see the whole picture, like like the previous one. Mm -hmm. I, I I think it's very annoying only getting a little piece of information and having to take years and years and years to see the whole picture. I'd rather see the whole picture and then work on the smaller parts and and develop yes. this. You know honing after you know where you're going <laughs> yes you get out in the car you want to know your destination you don't want to just drive random so the destination is there but you have to go by this that and there to get there right so in the pictorial pattern talk I've explored this topic you know many many times uh, in different ways and minor scales and chords and it's quite an extensive book um, I, I, a gentleman from Arizona, um, Phoenix, bought one recently and he was very complimentary about the book. He said his little group of teachers were very excited to get to know about my materials. So mm -hmm. and I, I think they perhaps saw the previous pod podcasts and got to know about it a little bit from that. Yes. Um, so wait, anyway, wait. the interval system seems huh? to free everybody up and of course you don't hear g and d you hear the distance you just like you you heard the interval between them. yeah and, um, the other side of what i've done i've developed an oral ear training course so you listen and you write down what you're hearing like like you did yep. in class and it uh, has a voiceover to tell you what to do how to train sing or clap or do this first and then the questions and you write it down in the book and you can check the answers. So it's a really practical ear training um, and theory together course. Um, and, yeah, I just send the audio as a download these days and people just get the book and work with that. So Perfect. And you can do so much on your own without waiting for a class. You, know, you can be do a 10 minutes of ear training every day, you know, so... Mm -hmm. That has me super inspired and motivated. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. This could just bring music, make music so much more accessible to so many people who feel, you know, that how do I engage it? And, you know, they want to learn, but how to start. Yes. Wow. I start my little ones on the, the junior primer. So the, from five, six up, I can be doing that. And I have a koala character being Australian oh. and a little koala character on the book. His name is Dexter the koala. Yeah. And somebody was asking me, one, one of uh, another teacher's using my books and I met one of her little students. She said, where did you get the name Dexter from? And I said, there's a history to that because I was in New York in 1979 and a pianist friend of mine Kirk Leitze got the job working with Dexter Gordon's band, the jazz musician, the jazz um, saxophone player. And I got to go to the recording session and meet him. And he nice. was a very tall, lanky person and it was just really amazing to meet. And then I thought, well, well you know, I, I, I needed an Australian character for my books, not 
because there were American books coming here, but one wanted something Australian. So I, I decided to call my my koala Dexter for dexterity. So it has. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> so it has, it has that meaning. And it, this this gentleman was Dexter Gordon, and another teacher of my my who was using my books. She also had a young boy who was nine who came to lessons, and his name was Dexter Gordon. Would you believe here in Australia? <laughs> He was just learning out of my books. He was learning, in, in, you know, Dexter Gordon in Australia was learning out of my Dexter books. So that was funny. I love that. More synchronicities. And yeah. that's a, like another affirmation about, um, yeah, you yeah. just love it. It's like the universe is echoing back to you. Yes, more of this. Yes, more of this. <laughs> <laughs> so, Yeah. yeah. You know, all my books, I've, I've written about 70 books. So there's the ear training piano. There's well, even a recorder book, actually, if you're wanting people to, to do that. And the recorder book's been published in America by Santarella Music too. Um, but that's those same concepts and on a woodwind instrument, you know, how far, what's your distance and things like that. But, yeah, have a look around on, on the website because there's got lots of different things that help. Absolutely. I yeah, I've looked around and you've got you've got some great resources on there for people to to engage with your work. I would love to see um institutions pick up with this and start teaching music teachers how to teach with this system. Yeah. That would be really awesome. And, and I'm sure some one... are. Yeah, okay. Yeah, hopefully they are. And then uh, the other layer that I do, like we've talked about intervals, we've got the scale patterns, but I do a lot with chord work and understanding the sounds of the chords and then got major, minor, diminished, augmented chords, suspended fourth chords. So that's in the piano methods, it's in the oral courses um, and to get people sharp with that. But I had a, a young student and we were doing the chords and you know, the ones I just mentioned, I said, what are the names of the chords? He said, oh, we've got major, minor, argumented and demolished. <laughs> <laughs> so out of the mouths of babes, you know. So that, that <laughs> makes that. <laughs> It's not going to stick with you unless it innately makes sense, like the the intervals and just sensing and under and seeing the patterns and then relating yes. that to your how do my fingers bring this out on the piano or the music instrument that yeah. is much it, it's a lot more intuitive and um, accessible, I think. Yes, it is, and, and it's that. And talking about ear training and stuff. Um, when I was about five, my mum was a music teacher and we had music in the house and there were three studio rooms in the front and there was a piano there. I had a piano in my room and she'd be in the front room and she'd play a note and I'd say, that's G. She said, how did you know that? And I, I could tell by, I had I, I had developed automatic perfect pitch because I was young and I'd started when I was four and I knew yeah. what it knew what a G was on the piano, but I could tell. So I, to this day, I can you know just listen to a chord progression. I can say what chords they are, which is, you know, great for a composer to have. Yes. <laughs> um, and then, but then when I did um, high school, I went to the Conservatorium of Music High School here in Sydney, which was fairly, you know, you had to do scholarship sort of thing to get in or, you know, sit, entrance tests and things. But we were doing the oral training, just as you were mentioning in your class, and they would give us these things to write down. And I figured I was like I was cheating <laughs> because I knew, I knew what the name of the note was and I could just I could just do it straight off. So my, you know, I, I did really well in oral training. But I, I mean, it's it's relative pitch that's more important than than um, um, the pure, pure tone. Um, 
memorization of the pitch. But yes. um, in other in other words, when you say that, you mean it's more important to to hear the intervals than it is to know if you hear a note that you know exactly that's an F sharp. Yes, some of us do. Some people will know that it's an F sharp. Sure, um, but if so you don't, that, still, if it, it's that that. But that's why when when I finished the uni or the, and well and the, and the and the con. I thought my students are not getting the same benefits as me at that many hours of oral training. How can they do that themselves? So that's when I developed the oral course that I was telling you about. So that it, you know, people, the contemporary oral course with the tapes and that, that's when I, I started devising that because I thought they need to be able to do it several times a week at home <clears throat> instead of like me. I had three, three course, three classes a week of oral training at the Conservatorium of Music High School, which is great, but most people don't get that. So yeah. I want it less accessible. But um and, it, and it, fun. It yeah. just sounds so much it sounds like an enjoyable way to practice, you know, you're set aside your time for music. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. So um, yeah, but and, and the chord, the chord understanding for me, I uh, went more past all that, and I really started to really like jazz chords, and get more into more and more jazz um, understanding. Um, became a, a great fan of music of Bill Evans, um, and actually got to meet him by chance through my friend Kirk Lightsey. I, I, I pulled some strings, and when I was in New York, I got to. Um, go to a concert from Bill Evans and also I was writing for a magazine called Jam Magazine at the time in Australia and so we were able to go backstage and do an interview with him so um, yeah pretty special. That uh, sounds like it so this has been an influence in your music as of late or for a while now? Long time long long time yeah um, um, yeah um, they I think they call Bill Evans the Chopin of the 20th century because what he did was he was classically trained, but he, you know, developed this harmonic language, which is amazing and still still amazes me. I now I'm gonna have to look at his work. That's oh. wonderful. Okay. Yeah, I've been when I think of jazz, I think, you know, of of two books that have been impactful to me were one called Not a Brahma, The World is Sound. Mm -hmm. I forget the author, but he he's very passionate about yeah, that. Yo Yo Kim Brent was that 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 was Yo Yo Kim Brent I think yes Brent. that's the author of that so. one okay thank you yeah, yeah and then and then this other one that I showed you earlier it's Fabian uh, Maman and Role of Music in the Twenty First Century mm -hmm. and it's um, the publisher is Tamado Press I guess is what it is okay. mm -hmm. and just like really cool study of how music affects cells absolutely and, yeah and then his his connection he he's got a really cool theory about jazz emerging at a time when we also had this rise in cancer and toxins in our environment and seeing that the those interval those chord intervals of like the seconds and the sevenths that our ear might say is a dissonant you know, so not positive or negative, it's just this almost can be a jarring sound sometimes yeah. compared to like a fifth, which is considered yeah. you know, very harmonious, that that purpose in jazz was to shatter cancer cells because that's what he was seeing under the microscope when he would play those chords. And, and wow. yeah. yeah, and so this kind of like, all for me circles back around to cymatics yes and which if people listening aren't familiar yet with cymatics um it is a study that that was started by um ernst cladney i forget what what uh, 1600s, I think. what's that was it in the 1600s that he started 1600s i believe where he took a plate a metal plate or um, yes you know, just flat plate sprinkled sand randomly on it and then um, set it down and struck a bow to vibrate the plate and saw that it formed these these radial symmetric patterns so like a mandala consistently and that you know yeah. if yeah 
And so then, then, sorry, the 18th Hans, century, not 16th century, 18th century. Okay, 18th century. thank you. And Hans um, Jenny then took that much further with different sounds and different equipment. Today, I've seen like 3D cymoscopes Yes. that and people are doing this with liquid and everything and then you you what go ahead the, the, the graphic that you showed before was all the cymatics do you want to show that a graphic yes again? i love to do that because somebody's found the all the the cymatic patterns for the whole piano and uh, it's done the whole whole lot and showed it where how it relates to the keyboard i thought i right. that's the second one of those See, they've got the, the notes from the whole piano there. Yes. And so it, that's what well, I wanted to talk about in Rosslyn Chapel because <clears throat> when I went there, um, there were 13 patterns uh, mm -hmm. all carved into all the columns in, in Rosslyn Chapel. Mm -hmm. And so my, my experience was... I had heard about it. I'd read about it somewhere because I've been reading about Rosslyn Chapel from the 1990s, way before um, Dan Brown wrote his Da Vinci um, Code, and he, of course, he filmed the last part of it in the in the Rosslyn Chapel. Um, and there's, it's also I don't know whether you know that Dan Brown is a composer. I did not know that. He has. No. He's. He's been recording orchestral work with the same company that does my CDs with Palmer mm -hmm. Recordings. And um, I just want talking about Dan Brown. He's got a beautiful book out called Wild Symphony for mm -hmm. children's book with the animals. But then you put your QR code on uh, each of that and you hear the music that he composed for each of the animals. So, mm -hmm. and Dan Brown's, I think his mum and dad were music teachers or organists and so there's a lot of yeah. um, music in his family and also his brother Gregory Brown is a composer mm -hmm. but <clears throat> I've been reading about the Rosslyn Chapel uh, <clears throat> and um, so the, the history to do with connected with the Freemasons and with the um, the Magdalene um, yes. um, things where they're talking about you know the the history from from Jesus and the bloodline of the Grail and be, way before Dan Brown wrote his book, he's probably taken some of those things and woven in, into his stories. Yeah. <clears throat> I wanted to get to Rosslyn Chapel, so I did that the year that we went to record the um, Cosmic Wheel in twenty seventeen. I made my, made my way to Scotland, and the chapel is about forty minutes away from Edinburgh, and I was there and the. Um, I don't know whether you've got a picture of Rosslyn Chapel there or not, or not but anyway. Um, no, so I might be able to find one. Yeah, the um, the guide, I had a chat with the guide and she said, oh, you're a musician, come have a look at this. And she said, come and have a look at all the carvings of, there's like some a woodwind player and a, a string player all carved into the walls and have a look at these blocks that are written down, the, you know, uh, carved into the columns. And she said, they're all the cymatic patterns, and they were carved in sixteen hundreds. In the sixteen hundreds, and they're showing these cymatic patterns. Yes. Yes. So yes. the cymatics here on these, you know, like cube faces here. Yes, all these cubes, and there were thirteen oh. different cubes that repeat the patterns repeat, and oh. then there's a composer by the name of Stuart Mitchell, mm -hmm. and he. He and his father uh, went to decode the patterns because his, I, I looked him up again. <clears throat> his father had been um, in in the Second World War in in the intelligence and doing pattern decoding. So he and his father went there, and the composer found patterns, found out what notes they were, and he's written the, the Rosslyn Motet um, based on these patterns. Oh, the thing so. Oh, yes. But I, I was thrilled to go there to actually, you know, I read about it so much and to, um, I didn't know so much about the sim the cymatic things. I knew there was things to do, references with music, but it wasn't until the guide showed me and took me uh, to, to actually show me those on the columns that I, I became fully aware of it. And um, oh, it was, it was such, such a thrilling thing. 
<clears throat> and then again, I did a bit more research on it. One of the people involved in the building of the chapel had been traveling to China. Uh -huh. And in China, they'd already been discovering things to do with sound and patterns previous to that. So he brought some of that knowledge back. And in the chapel, they, they say we can prove that this actually happened because there's pictures of, uh, oh, you found another one there. You all yeah. look at that. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Um, in, the, in the chapel, you find Chinese dragons carved into the thing. So you sort of prove the China connection. Wow. And the other you connection. Know, I was just even looking at this image and that kind of behind this, these columns, and then the side almost looks like the clouds you'd see in a lot of Chinese art. And then, of course, one of the cymatic forms yeah. is above. But this, yeah, this fascinates me here that it, it looks like the, the fingers of this cherub are plucking strings, essentially. Yes. And they yeah, this is from Crystal Link, Stuart, Stuart Mitchell's work. Oh, yes, this is the composer I was talking about. Yeah. yeah. So they, he and they, they, they must, they, there's probably millions of hidden codes <laughs> all through it. Right. Oh, man, it would be, it would be fascinating to be one of their carvers. Yes. Doing all this. And uh, they said the carvers came from all over the place, so they were itinerant. But what fascinated me when I read about Ross and Chapel in the early time was that they've got carvings of um, corn and aloe vera from the New World a uh, hundred years before it was so-called um, um, discovered and, and settled in America. So yeah. they, so they were actually the Sinclair family who um, built the chapel were traders, and there's there's um, from what the, I've been reading that they were actually traveling north. Um, up sort of to uh, from England up to sort of Newfoundland and, uh -huh. and keep trading that you know there was a trade route already and like the Leif Erikson and the Vikings came into um, to the north of America there um, so mm -hmm. there was a lot of trading and other things going on even before the official discovery and the official you know um, people pilgrim fathers going over uh, to America and things like that there's so, so much evidence coming out now that's just showing how so much of this knowledge that, you know, is from ancient times is spread all around the world and how for, you know, it's just maybe 50 years ago or something, people were just thinking, no, it was, it's just us here when, you know, um, not, not seeing how much we've shared information and had really powerful wisdom in in ancient times you know even yes. thousands and thousands of years ago globally um just so much that's shared now on the internet it's one of the things i really appreciate about the internet is that people are starting to connect those dots and say yeah you know yeah there is ancient ancient knowledge that's been carried it's not just one culture or civilization that was above all the rest of us it's like Every, yeah. everyone and yeah. that's back to the Jungian um, um, writing where he um, investigated uh, he, he visited America the American Indians he would visit Africa I think he, also India and he just saw the archetypal stories that each of the um, areas had not knowing each other but they have the same sort of creation stories and things like that and and that they the dreams um in the collective unconscious you know people can have the same dreams anywhere in the world uh, <clears throat> and so that was the internet of the day before we had our internet was this collective unconscious way of bringing it you know to life yeah fascinating and i think yeah and i think that when people were working with that that method like now the internet is just reflecting back to us technology that we have in our systems already we are energetic conscious beings with the you know um able to interface here in the physical realm because we have neurons the fire and you know all of this we have this technology within us that 
um, if we didn't have the internet, but we remembered that we could do these things, we would be so practiced at it that we would rely more on the dreams. And I know that, that there are cultures that are based around, you know, um, collective dreaming, mm -hmm. um, because we know that there is this quantum level or morphogenic fields or, you know, whatever you want to call it, where information is shared across space time and um that yeah people would collect their information their pieces and put it together to create a form a bigger picture of what's going on in the world yes yeah and you know, i'm just uh, thinking about the the the, uh, the mandala symbolism that crops up all over the place um you know and that back, back to sacred geometry you know we've got your, your square with your circle with your, and the, you know the, the geometry is all in the mandala, isn't it? Um, yes. And um, and to me, it's so related to numbers too, because a mandala is kind of an array based on a certain number. You're dividing a circle into x number of equal parts and creating yes. a repeating pattern around that center point, that core. And sacred geometry really does the same thing. You know, whether you have a you have a seven pointed star or a, a square, the four directions, you know, whatever it's based on, there's a number with the resonance that, you know, kind of comes back around again to music because it's frequency, um, it's ratio and proportion, you mm -hmm. know. So how many parts, there's a number there that relate to how many parts of a number of something over here and then we put it together and we have harmony or just what we perceive as disharmony, um, but can balance like you were, you were referring earlier to when we were talking before um, to Masuru Emoto's work on mm. messages in water, which yeah. I happen to talk about my last Monday musing podcast. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> and, uh, yeah. Synchronicity again, that I just felt compelled to talk about fractals and, and our yes. consciousness, how we affect water. Yes, yes. And then the whole point is if we can affect water with our thoughts and we're all made up of 90% water, 98% water, how do our thoughts affect other people? And yes. Yeah. So yes. People, that. plants and animals and life, that that, that oh, sustains yeah. our life. I've got another interesting story from, okay. from that. Um, first of all, that you we were talking about, that's one of the pictures from the book. Can you? Is, it's that so one harmonious. It's beautiful. I see it really clearly. Um, if, if a person's just I, listening on the podcast, Mozart. go ahead. That's, that's listening to Mozart's music. Mozart. And it looks like a, the most beautifully, perfectly formed crystal, uh, like snowflake. Yeah. People who aren't familiar with the work and you're listening on the podcast, just imagine the most um delicate beautifully intricately formed snowflake and you'll have in your mind's eye what um mozart's music might sound like in frozen water yes it's, it is it's truly amazing um, it is this book has got pictures from beethoven's music and mozart's and and there was there's Tchaikovsky, if, if anyone looks at uh, Bud Powell, the jazz jazz musician, and Beatles, oh. um, and Elvis Presley stuff as well. Oh, oh yeah, the El Elvis Presley one. Um, it's uh, Heartbreak Hotel, and the crystal is divided into two parts. <gasps> Look at that! Isn't that fascinating? Because it's as though they're splitting apart. Yeah, and they they're. A little more simple you see the hexagonal shape on one and then the second one coming off looks a little distorted it's not quite as symmetrical and it's more like a heartbreak definitely yeah <laughs> the way we totally amazing um i'll just do another talking about um connections and music and sound when i went to visit the lady in norfolk and i and we were talking about the ankh earlier um, yeah. she said, come out and have a listen to this. And she had a a, a machine with a, a, was connected with a lead and, and had a little clip. And she put the clip onto the plant and we had heard the plant singing. 
Isn't that amazing? This is in the 1990s, 1996. Um, and I've seen people doing more with that. But she said, look, we'll put it on this really nice, you know, um, rose and we got some lovely sounds and we put it um, on another lovely plant, you know, a bit, a bit of vegetable, you got a different sound. And then we put it on a weed and we got we got absolute sort of chaos, chaotic. Oh, my goodness. And she said it also depends of how you interpret this is quantum, is it quantum physics, how you feel about the plant when you put it on. If you feel you like the plant, you it'll respond and give you nice sounds. And um yeah, well, there's it's, there's been studies on that with plants in a room that are hooked up to those those kinds of monitors. And if somebody walks into the room feeling angry or you know just a harsh energy that it's directed outwardly those plants respond like really disharmoniously and of course you see them not grow as well that long term if you watch them that kind yes. of environment of yeah and then of course if they walk in happy or joyful or loving then that sound that you would get back from the plant is just yeah I mean, and i actually it was nice that I got an exp uh, personal experience of that with her, with this lady, you know. I mean, you can read about it when everybody else is doing it, but I was actually there and it was. You got to, strange. and that's inspiring when you see it in person. And yeah. and it even reminds me, it takes me to um, what I understand about indigenous cultures. And they might look at that kind of technology and say, well, of course, we've been perceiving this because they have carried forward the wisdom of how to do that yes. and, and the apparatus of, of our own minds and kind of hearing the music within by relating remembering that we're all related and connected to those things around us it's beautiful yes yes, yes we're we're just part of the uh, you know the, all the vibrating cells on the planet you know and and just back to the, how awful is this war thing? I mean, I just I don't want to bring everyone down, but yeah, why why are these people not opening up to you know we're 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 all one, you know people people are all connected. Um, right. Why, what are you doing anyway? So I don't want to be well. Sorry. I when you bring that up, I just think you know there's times where you know, we got to feel what we feel about it because it's it, we're affected by it and. Mm. And so there might be grief or sadness for an empathy for the people who are suffering. Yes. And then the understanding that there may be people taking action that we don't have direct access to, but when we all collectively bring, you know, a heart centered love and care, a vibration of gratitude and care and visions of what we want to see in the world. And we collectively amplify that just like measuring the plant when you're, in the room and you look at your own attitudes and how it's affecting that it is spreading out through the world and and you know that's something we can do about it because yes. you know um we don't want to stay affected or stuck in a, a negative mindset that brings everything and everyone down and affects yes. that way you know yes. it's not denying our feelings just moving through it and then transitioning and shifting it into you know what we want and playing beautiful music <laughs> right yeah well you, you know um the the music it seems to be coming through me because i always feel like when i start writing i go into that other space and it's i'm channeling channeling um, that yeah. that's that's how i feel um and i i actually had a, a clairvoyant reading Two thousand, and I wrote this music called Spirit Visions. Since doing that, and um, it, it it was like I feel like when I'm writing that it's it's magic music coming down. And a lot of people are just saying they really like the melodies that I'm coming up with and the chord progressions and things. And it's not it's not angular music. It, it, I I think we have enough of that going in negative stuff in the world. Yeah. I need to bring balance it with more and more positive sounding music more with a melody with something will make you feel joyous something will up uplifting right. and um even if it might be a sad piece of music i still want to bring 
moments where we're going, oh, well, you know, there's hope and joy coming. And um, um, yeah, so that's that's me as a composer. joy um, um, my colleague who plays my music on the boats he he, he plays my jacaro rumba and the bossa nova what's called bossa sonora on cruise ships and uh, he just said um, it's it's a joy to bring this music to people you know so and I thought well that's where I'm I'm really happy because that's my aim with my music is to make people go I can dance to this or I can sing with it or I can breathe with it you know so yeah maybe I I would like to find one and include one in my next ecstatic dance playlist I I do DJing for we hold an ecstatic dance here in Mount Shasta and so um I'm always looking for great music because it will it'll it'll take you on a journey through those things that kind of maybe shake you up a little so you can see where 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 are my sad points or my trigger points or where am I feeling angry and then give you an opportunity to shake it out and yeah. work with it. And then the most important part is bring you into this space. So like, we're, okay, I've released all that. Now I can access my true authentic essence and express that. Mm-hmm. And that's the pure joy. And so well, music, and that's the way I, comp- I do a music set for dance is to bring that so I'm excited to find well there's a heap of things on my sensation album um yeah so the the sensations it's got orchestral things and um it's got the this jacaro rumba for violin and piano which is very um dancey you know um and uh yeah so that then there's spirit visions which is on polaris anyway you can check it out on my website but uh, it could be quite a few that would fit into your ecstatic dance sort of um category and i've just um done a string arrangement of uh pieces i read for saxophones called warm winds in havana and i went to cuba for the recording of that and uh that's on the, uh, the abrazo album um, but I've been asked to write a string arrangement of that, and we're going to be uh, giving that a good run through this coming week. So that that'll be another one mm-hmm. for strings, and maybe put percussion with that as well. So um, yeah, six all, all exciting. And look out for later in the year when we uh, release my La Vida Apasionada Suite for um, uh, it's a Latin, uh, for strings. I've got. Um, um, violin one and two, cello, double bass, um, guitar, piano, percussion. So, and there's eight pieces in this suite: um, a bossa nova, a tango, a cha cha, um, a samba, all that sort of variety. And we're working on editing that at the moment. So, awesome! Um, that sounds wonderful. Yeah, the overture for it's up on my on my YouTube channel with just piano and violin, so you can hear us. Uh, you know, a uh, half a minute of each of the eight pieces, and that that's what's going to be in the suite. Mm. Um, a lot of fun writing that and playing and dancing to it. <laughs> Excited about that. Great. You know, m- my thoughts were just kind of going back to to, to um, your intention with your music and your connection to the physical form, and then realizing that you know plant life organic life our physical bodies are all made up of the um golden mean proportion and fibonacci you know numbers are are related into that like um you know number of pine cone spirals in one direction and the other direction or fibonacci numbers and i understand that you are very um well you understand this with music and how it interconnects and it's 
Shall we talk about the the, the Fibonacci and the piano? Yeah. Um, one thing that um, Trudy says in her book, the the map of music book um, on the Fibonacci is um, that you have the black keys in twos and threes, and the two and the three. You have eight white keys, and you add you've got thirteen keys in one octave, but mm -hmm. also um, in the sense of you have one, which is a semitone, two, which is a whole tone, three, which is your third, then you have a fifth, then you have your octave, and then if you add all the notes, you got the 13. So I thought that was interesting. All Fibonacci numbers. Yeah. Yeah. And Worth for it. listeners who this is all new to them, I'll just briefly explain the Fibonacci numbers again are um, related to the proportions of the way all organic life is based and very closely related to the golden mean or golden ratio. Um, the Greeks would call it fee, the fee ratio, uh, 1.618 on and on and on, re repeating forever without ever resolving or repeating. But mm -hmm. it just goes on forever. So it's like this, this bridge to infinity through the finite in the physical realm and that music what what we you know we really started i don't know if it started before um the the um the greek mystery schools but i'm sure in egypt and the even earlier than that that people were understanding what happens when you pluck a string and you see the vibration and then you cut it in half or you know like half a bit half it, you, you half it and you pluck it again and you get an octave higher and if you're breaking this down into ratios, you end up with the the structure that you just mentioned, the the half tone, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the you know, the octave, yeah. all the ratios that connect to the Fibonacci. Yes. It's, it just it manifests in so many things, doesn't it? It does. Um, um, Trudy talks about Beethoven. Um, dividing the composition up in that those proportions with the number of bars that do something and the next of bars that do um, something. And so the, the, the one to the 0.618 proportion in, in the bars and, and also Bar Bella Bartok did it in his music. So oh. there's some interesting things in the math and music connection book. I must just talk about, um, saw a movie called The Cave of Dreams uh -huh. and the documentary about the caves that they found in France, where the animal, uh, the you know ancient peoples carved, oh, did paintings of animals on on the things, and um, but during that documentary, they actually said, "Here's a bone flute that we found in the cave, or you know of that of that time, was it 50,000 years ago." Yeah. And the person played the flute, and it was the pentatonic scale. Wow! So how talking about how far how far back do we go? Right. They they, they worked out the scale um, on on yeah. the bone flute. Yeah. And so pentatonics um, appeal to so many people because it's the five fifths in a row, and and after. You tune the five fifths when you get to the sixth one it's not quite in tune anymore so people sort of tend not to go until we got um to tempered tuning you're very restricted in the tones that could be really in tune yes so you're, safe, you're usually safe with the first five fifths in in tune so sam meant much of um japanese or chinese music from that time is is pentatonic as are a lot of Scottish and Irish folk songs and American, um, you know, traditional music folk music is is pentatonic because you could get your instruments in tune for the first five fifths and after that the tuning went a bit out. Yeah. Um, so um, that's so that's that's fascinating. Yeah, yeah. Right. And that it is to me like I love hearing pentatonic. Uh, scales it's I could just play on them for a long time I don't know what it is about them that it, what it is is if your pentatonic scale uh, if anyone's listening on C is C D E G A 
and then the top C. So you're missing the fourth and the seventh note. You're missing that's the F and the B, and that's the tritone. And when you play a tritone, it's very tense and needs to be resolved. Right. So if you hit the tritone notes, you have to go bum, bum, you have to finish it off. Yeah. If you don't have the tritone, you can sit and float on pentatonic for a long time. It doesn't feel like, oh, I've got to come to a stop. And that's why yeah. a lot of healing music is in pentatonic. That makes it, sense to me. Keep, yeah. keep, keep it floating, you know, feeling rather, rather than the tension. And, yes. and being, a, being a level two Reiki person and musician, I wonder you must have an even more unique perspective of of healing with with music and and energy. Has that come through in any particular way for you? I think mainly just in my own composition, in the in the way since I did the Reiki, when, after I did Reiki, the first piece I wrote was called When Spirits Saw. Yeah. And it's for the saxophone and piano. Mm -hmm. And I put in long sections where the saxophone is holding is a really long note and it encourages you to breathe, you know, to, to deep to deep breathe while you listen to the music. And uh, and there's soaring sections that take you up, you know, into um, into the ether, you know, so that, um, yeah, it, it hopefully will take your soul with you when you're listening to that. So... Um, Luckily for me, that now that piece is now on the um, English examination system for music. It's been oh. called the ABRS, ABRSM, and um, it's in the eighth grade syllabus for people to play. Yeah. But there's um, there's a, a YouTube clip of us playing um, the saxophone, myself playing it. If some people want to have a listen, um, so yeah. So I think that the main I mean, I I've, uh, I love being the Reiki Two Channel, and if it's more really just for myself and my family and my close people, because I don't, I'm not a you know full time practitioner. I don't have time. Right. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but it's really comes through in my music. And and people can, in, in a way, that's the that's how it comes through then to receive it instead of being in a room on a table with a practitioner. They're listening to your music. And yes. receiving, you know, we were talking about the going into meditation state when you're 60 beats per minute, music of that nature. Um, so you can breathe and meditate at 60, calm your heart rate down. Uh -huh. um, so that's, uh, I've sort of tried to keep that in mind with some of the pieces that I've written as well for to achieve that. Um, yeah. Does that help like with a theta brainwave maybe yeah 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 have you have you done any um work with the tuning of a at 432 hertz or kind of looking at that um only only that um you know i understand the understanding of that and that i was talking about sarah hopkins is the tuning of her um her instruments is is the natural tuning the 432 which is supposed to affect our bodies in a much more resonant way isn't it yeah. than the 440 my um, understanding it too is just that the way that it's resonant is that it is a number that is in alignment with the ratios of planetary and celestial bodies and so that you know and it comes up in um i believe it's a fibonacci number if i remember right i should yeah. know that but it's just ties in with everything. <laughs> so it's yes. like one unifying frequency, you know, that, that is, yeah. Really when I read the Joachim Berendt book many years ago, it was called The Third Ear. Okay. The Third um, Ear. Yeah. Okay. Um, I um, don't know where it's it's disappeared out of my collection. I don't know where it is, but I remember him talking about that the Indians knew the frequency at the which the world spins. Oh, which, and it's it's the G below middle C, and that's where they sing the Om, and um, and and all their instruments that have the um, the portatives, you know, where they the little organs that have the drone. 
the drone yes. is G because that's the the vibration of the the spinning of the world is is and G is the note. We've covered a lot of topics. We've spent a lot of time, and there are so many beautiful life experiences that you shared with us today that help us relate to the importance of music and synchronicity and healing and sound healing and how we can be empowered with music mm. are there are there any other thoughts or messages that you feel are important to share in regards to music the, the in sacred geometry and music cymatics any anything that you uh, like I think we've covered a, we've covered most of it today in all the different things we've um yeah. we've covered um and uh, I suppose it's just an ongoing process and um you know I, I'm hoping that more music flows through and comes through at you know um yes and it connects with people as time goes on you know because um uh, I'm yeah. I always seem to be involved in some new project here and there. So, um, yeah, well, I, we'll and I, I hope it's in the U.S. soon, in a, in a place that I can get to and hear <laughs> live. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll we, we'll see what happens. Um, um, I'm with a company uh, called Price Attractions, and they are um working on my behalf to see whether orchestras would like to play my music and things like that so we'll see what happens with that and uh, if, if something unfolds but meanwhile I'll be in Europe so you have to come across to Amsterdam oh too bad I'll have to go to Europe well I'll envision um your path unfolding with grace and ease to share this beautiful harmonious music to the world that's um you're an inspiration and i'm really grateful to be able to talk to you to meet you mm -hmm. to share this with the world as you're sharing with the world yeah it's been delightful having having the conversation with yourself and exploring all the topics together and uh Indeed. very joyous morning for me and evening for you <laughs> yes. beautiful well with that um i'd like to thank you again i look forward to I, what i hope are more community conversations together yeah. and um yeah enjoy a beautiful day there in sydney and to, to all of our listeners um may you be inspired by this talk this and music um how may may your views of the world be expanded in ways that support you on your path and until next time thank you so much thank you been wonderful <laughs>